and he gazes upon the most beautiful bronze statue of a Siamese cat. So he asks the store owner, how much you want for that statue? The guy says, it's a hundred bucks for the statue and a thousand dollars for the story that goes with it. The guy says, I don't care about the story, but I do want the statue. So he pays for the statue. The shop owner says, all right, but I guarantee you'll be back for the story. So the man walks out of the shop, he starts down the street carrying the cat statue, he comes to a crosswalk, happens to glance behind him, sees three or four cats sitting about 10 feet away looking at him. So he shrugs it off and, and uh, it keeps going. When the light changes, he goes several more blocks, another crosswalk he looks back. This time there's 30 cats sitting behind her looking at him. The man starts to get a little nervous, picks up his pace when the light changes. By the time the man reaches the pier at the end of the street, he looks back and there's a couple of thousand cats sitting there looking at him. There were so many cats that there was no way to get off the pier without going through the cats. And he knew there was no way he was gonna do that. In a panic, he turned toward the water and heaved the statue as far as he could. Amazingly, all the cats ran right past him and jumped in the water after the statue had ground. The man, still shaking from the ordeal, started running back to the shop, burst in through the door. The shop owner says, I told you you'd be back for the story. The man said, I don't care about the story. Would you have a statue of a politician? <laughs> That, of course, is not a true story. <laughs> First Peter says this in chapter 5, verse 10 and 11. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Would you bow your heads? Dear Lord. This is a precious time when we actually serve your word, the morsels of your word, to the believers in this place. Lord, we just pray that you will put an anointing on the word, that you will direct it to where you want it to go, and then it will have the cause, the effect that you want it to have in Jesus' name. Amen. So as Christian believers, we are called. We are created by God. We are called by God. We're set apart for God. He calls us and sets us apart. And he has a purpose for us. A purpose for you. Isaiah 43, 10 and 12. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. Verse 11, even I am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior. This was written back in Isaiah. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed. I, and not some foreign God among you, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. The calling is to bear witness to the fact that the Lord is God and that there is no other. We are the witnesses. We are the carriers of the facts. When you go, if you're called to be a witness in a trial, in a court, you either have seen something or you have experienced something or you have some kind of expertise that has a bearing on the trial. Some witnesses have expertise, some that bears on the opinion of the jury. I've only been a witness in a trial um, 
twice. Once because of something I saw, once because of something that I had experienced, and one time I was rejected as a witness because I knew the attorney, and I had photographed the victim for the attorney, and so they decided I was not a suitable witness. God calls us to verify what he has done and who he is. We're called as witnesses to verify who he is and what he has done. We're in league with the chosen servant, Christ himself. We are to, by our witness, verify that there is no other God, no other Savior. Jesus himself verified that. John 14, 6 and 7. And I'm sure you all know this verse. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Christ himself bore witness. And we are in league with him when we do that. <laughs> He has revealed, in verse 12, saved and proclaimed. We only know what God reveals. The revealing that the Savior has come and that we have hope in eternity. That is revealed by God, so it's witnessed by us. We have glimpses of what the future will bring, just glimpses. But God has an awesome plan for us. He only reveals the part of it that he wants us to know. We don't know all of it. We just know parts of it. And that's what he has proclaimed. God's word is full of proclamations. Prophecies are proclamations of what will happen. Everything that will happen, God will make happen. For some, the future, that is eternity, will be glorious. For some, it will be unimaginably tragic. Hell's fire is real. Those who hear what is witnessed to have the option to receive and to believe. They have the option to embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior. Every person is confronted by the truth of the gospel. Every person. What it says in Titus chapter 2, 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. All people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Verse 13, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of, of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. It's offered to all people, it says in verse 11. All people. All people. What if they haven't heard the gospel? What, they call, what we call the question of the heathen. What if they haven't heard anything about it? It's offered to all people. It says that in very plain terms. Well, according to this, the grace of God has appeared to everyone, and we are, no one has any excuse. Being born again comes with a task. When you accept Christ as your Savior, that comes as a blessing, but it comes with a task, and it comes with trials. Being a witness comes with challenges. Satan is the god of this world. He does everything he can to hinder the gospel. He will try to destroy the witnesses as well as the message. He does everything he can to keep the witnesses from sharing the good news. Everything he can. From sharing the gospel that brings the hope of eternal life. So we face trials of many kinds. They were facing trials way back in Jesus' time. He faced trials. The apostles faced trials. Paul faced trials. They all faced trials. 
Most of them were killed for their faith. The book of James offered, offers this about the trials. James chapter 1. Verse 2 to 12. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. We don't think of trials as being joyful, do we? We don't say, oh boy, here comes another trial. I can hardly wait for the next one. The next one's coming. <laughs> We're not real eager for it. Consider pure joy when you face many trials. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So, trials test your faith. See how you're going to react, how you're going to do. Perseverance is necessary to rise above the trials and carry the obligation of witnessing. Should I say that again? Perseverance is necessary to rise above the trials and carry the obligation of witnessing. The path of the believer is strewn with obstacles. That path has boulders and pitfalls. We experience the trials associated with the curse. You know, bad things happen to good people. We must, must not think ourselves exempt from trials just because we're God's children. We are bound for glory, but not here. We will have illness, weakness, infirmity, hardship. Most of you know what that's like. <laughs> have illness and hardship and infirmity. We all know. And we have hardship and infirmity in our parents and in the, all kinds of things. It's just review the prayer requests that were requested today. But we also have trials that are placed there by the enemy. Have no doubt we have a very real enemy. He's a master deceiver. He's the father of all lies. He's the opposite of the goodness of God. Where God loves you, he hates you. The enemy uses trials and afflictions to discourage us from carrying the witness, from carrying the gospel. So that we will focus on the trial instead of on the task. It's easy to focus on the trial. It's easy to think about that because that's what's in your face. But we need to focus on the task and the task master, Jesus himself. Perseverance is determination to overcome. Determination. Perseverance is not just holding on until the end. Perseverance is carrying on, moving, carrying the witness until God calls us home. There's a struggle in perseverance, a struggle. We can't just hope that it's going to go away. The, struggle, the, str the trials that keep the believer from being God's witness just don't go away. If the time were not shortened, the Bible says, even the elect of God would not stand. With God's help, we can surmount the trials. We can rise above the trials. Put on the full armor of God and rise above it. Psalm 18, 28 to 29. You, Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. With your help, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. See, with God as our taskmaster, we can accomplish the things that we never thought possible. Continuing in verse 4 of James chapter 1. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That's the work of perseverance. 
verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given you. So wisdom is part of how we persevere. When we look at things that are in our face and in our way and obstacles, we have to access God's wisdom to rise above those things so they don't distract us from what God wants us to do. Thank you. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. God guides us with his wisdom in times of trial. You know, we have our own wisdom, but our own wisdom, the motive of it is our own self-interest. And God says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. So we need access, need access God's wisdom when we're in trial. We need powerful wisdom to stay in the battle. We need powerful wisdom to escape the fiery darts of the enemy. Have you ever been there? God's wisdom is available to us all. All we need to do, according to this verse, is to ask. Verse 6, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Specifically, that means, referring to the previous verse, when you ask for wisdom from God. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. The task is to witness that the Lord is God and that there is no other, that there's no other way to heaven or to, in, to, to be in God's grace to be witness, to witness that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And he said, no man comes to the Father except through me. The task isn't an easy task because it's an uphill battle, because there are trials, because there are struggles, because we have an enemy that's trying to stop us and stop the message. We will be cast down, the Bible says, but not destroyed. You can expect to be cast down but not destroyed. So we need to be, number one, strong. 2 Corinthians 4, 16, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, but inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Number two, from Philippians 1, 27 to 28, whatever happens, can, number two the, is firm. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about it, about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. And verse 28, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. In addition to strong and firm, we need to be steadfast. 1 Peter 5, 10, and 11, which was our opening verse today in the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. After you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Every soul that truly loves God will have its trials in this life. We all have a task. God expects us to carry the light of the truth of the gospel into dark places in this world and dark places in people's lives and their hearts. Every soul that loves God will have its reward in the world above where love is made perfect. 
Salvation comes with a task. The task comes with trials. Overcoming the trials, 1 John 4.4. 4. You, dear children, are from God, and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Overcoming. John 16, 33, I have told you these things, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus himself said, you, you're going to have trouble. If you, if, you, if you take on the task and carry the gospel, you're going to have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. It's just a temporary place. And we don't belong here. We don't. We don't belong here. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We belong in the next one. That's our home. For all of eternity. Revelation chapter 3 and 31. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my father's throne. Just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. And the last one, Revelation 12, 11, They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. My friends, when you're born again, you have a task. It's to be a witness. It's to carry the gospel. It's to share the good news with people. People that you know, people you see, people that are hurting. And, and if they don't have Jesus, they're all hurting. Some, most of them don't know it, but they are. Our hurting is a different kind of hurting. But the task comes with a trial. Carrying that load on a steep path needs help. God's help. And we have it. We have it. Just don't let go of it. Just don't let go of that task. The Lord says, who will I send? And the prophet says, send me. I'll do it. I'll do the task. Send me. So we need to be send me verse. We need to be the people who will say, yes, Lord, I'll take it. And there's one task after another, after another. Some of them are little ones. Some of them are big ones. Some of them are just talking to a hurting person and saying, how can I pray for you? I've done that in the grocery store. One guy said, no. But some of them say, sure. How blessed you get when you pray for somebody that you don't even know and never saw before in a grocery store or on a park bench or something. And all they can do is say no. That's the uphill part of it. And one of the uphill parts of it is just getting up the nerve to go do that. Because the devil doesn't want you to do that. No, 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 no. You can't do that. You don't know enough to do that. You don't speak well to do that. You can't do that. You can't carry that task. The devil tries with all of his lies to stop us from carrying the gospel. And that's the task from being God's people, from showing our love in the world. Amen. We just end because I'm done talking now. <laughs> And thank you, visitors, for being with us. It's awesome to have some new faces. Hurry back and bring some more with you. We have plenty of seats. Dear Lord, we do thank you this morning for the awesome God that you are. Awesome, awesome. And that you have shed your blood to pay the penalty for our sins. And as we understand that our, that our salvation comes with this task, we put it on our shoulders, Lord. And with your help, we will continue to spread the gospel, to do the work, to carry the task. And, that you, and we believe that you will get us through the trials in Jesus' name. Go with us all now. Keep us safe until we meet again in Jesus' name. Amen.